Well, first, I want to introduce my good friend, Chris Martinson. Big hand for Chris. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and your background, because it's quite impressive. Hey, I'm Chris Martinson, uh, former scientist once upon a time, um, pathology degree, did a lot of science, took a turn, went and got an MBA, went into business for a long time. And for the past 15 years, I've been the owner and operator of a site called Peak Prosperity. Has anybody heard of Peak Prosperity out there? Oh, nice. Excellent, excellent. So, um... This is an online community of people, and we're, we're interested in resilience and how to get ahead and understanding where the puck's going to be so we can skate there and just trying to figure out where everything's going. So I'm a curious guy, and I take my science and my business and put it together, and I tell stories. Well, I, I've read all your books, and I love, I love your site, and I love your podcasts and, and the videos you guys put out. So let's jump right in. you got to read between the lines with what the, where, where the Fed is and where they're going. So I'd love to hear what you think. First up, we have to understand that the Federal Reserve are monetary vandals, okay? They, they create the problems. They're, they're like the arsonist who's also the firefighter, you know? This is how they operate. So Jerome Powell's on record saying a couple of things lately. First, he noted that the levels of debt in the United States, federal debt only, are now increasing much, much, much faster than our income or our GDP. And he's next said that he's not going to fund that anymore. If the Federal Reserve does not fund that debt, it's literally lights out. So, of course, they'll have to. So, I'm going to say Jerome Powell was not being honest in that statement. I think maybe he thought he was going to be honest, Ken, but he can't be honest because if the Federal Reserve doesn't monetize that debt, it's game over for the fiscal budget. Well, it's all transitional anyway, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, everything's transitory. <laughs> I know, I have yeah. to laugh because they, their positioning statements, they, they just keep um, they just keep coming. So so we've had 10 rate increases. Mm -hmm. Things are crashing. Mm -hmm. What inning do you think we're in? Probably inning five because the you know, here's what I trust that Jerome is going to do. He said he's going to raise rates until he breaks the system, right? Now he, he wants to break labor, right? He doesn't care about capital as much, but he wants, he, he thought it was, it's unacceptable to the Federal Reserve whenever wages start to rise. So he's going to keep applying pressure until he sees wages crack, and he needs them to crack pretty meaningfully because he's got inflation. He wants to get inflation to 2%. Maybe 3 they're going to put some wiggle room on that at this point in time. So they're going to have to keep rates high for as long as necessary to get that done, and we are starting to see, as you, you would know better than I, right, the impact this is happening in all sorts of sectors, commercial real estate, in niches, right, office buildings, obviously, but this is starting to really impact a lot of interest rate sensitive businesses. And that's why I think people should study the Federal Reserve. You got to understand what they're doing because it's not just a guy giving mumbly statements, which it is. They control everything about how the story's going to go. I had you come to one of my properties and I said, how, you know, because you're an expert at getting things off the grid. You know, you looked at the water, you looked at the solar, you looked at the electrical, you looked at all that stuff, and we're trying to do a zero carbon footprint. So can you talk a little bit about, about that? Because, you know, what you've been able to do is be completely self-sustaining. And I think one of the risks we have moving forward is, is that we're tethered to all these things that are super inflationary. Well, not just inflationary. A, a big thing that I talk about is, is how our systems are very cost efficient, but they're not very resilient. Right. So we have these 12,000 mile supply chains to create, you know, these headphones. We have um, five days of food in any particular community out there, any city. Right. And so one of the things I talk about is what would happen if this is a thought game. What would happen if tail risk? But what would happen if our money system really started to break down or pick another threat? Right. The cyber pandemic they keep promising is going to happen or whatever. Doesn't matter what the story is. So. It just makes sense to me that like carrying fire insurance on a building can that we ought to we ought to maybe understand pull some of those other things a little closer to home right so i think it's it's time for us to bring some of that food resilience home our emotional resilience is exceedingly important our social capital is exceedingly important so i'm not a guy here saying hey you know we should all like get bunkers and you know hunker down and wait be positive get out there thrive bring things into your life that add a lot of joy to it and resilience because i Listen, we can't trust that the system is going to carry on. Right, right, and and I know one of the big factors in one of your, uh, you know, one of the multiple podcasts and multiple videos, and certainly in your book, is what you call peak oil. So oil, so oil. Can you explain how oil is basically in everything? Almost, <laughs> it seems like it's everything. So certainly transportation of everything, yeah. but you know also in a lot of products. Oil is in 
everything. It's me. I'm, I'm walking oil right now because I eat food and food is grown with oil. Right? How's that? Well, obviously the tractors, obviously the transportation, the cooling, you know, the heating, cooking of it, all that, but as well the fertilizers and the pesticides, the herbicides that are all going in as input. So when you look at oil as an input, it's in everything because oil is about in the next five, 10 years is going to be the single dominant subject in our lives. It's going to drive more than the Fed. And when people ask me, hey, Chris, what will make the Fed finally lose control? It's oil. Oh, wow. That's that's the one thing that's out of their control. You can't print it. Nothing you can do about it. And that's what could drag this whole thing off of their plate. But let's talk about the petrodollar and why that could be a risk. So this is such fascinating history, right? So we're fighting the Vietnam War. Things are not going all that well from a monetary standpoint. Inflation has really taken off, much like the inflation we have today. Only we had gold-backed dollars due to Bretton Woods. So anybody in the world could come in with 35 U.S. dollars and exchange it for an ounce of gold. All our gold was hemorrhaging. That's August 15, 1971. They slammed the gold window, right? That was Nixon. So then what do you do? And they fixed the price, too, by the way. You know, gold, of 35. Yeah, fixing prices, that always works. Yeah. That's a good plan, right? So now what do you do? The dollar's now not backed by anything, and it was getting really tenuous. So Henry Kissinger, I think, is an evil guy, but he's an evil genius. And he came up with this idea that what we're going to do is back the dollar with oil. But not our oil. We're going to back it with Saudi Arabian oil. So he created this thing called the petrodollar, which, which basically enshrined this one thing. If you were somebody in the world and you wanted to buy oil, you had to conduct that in dollars. So I don't care if you're Chile wanting to buy oil from Yemen, you're going to conduct that trade in dollars. So it creates huge demand for dollars. And that was brilliant. It actually backed the dollar. People say, oh, the dollar's not backed by anything. No, it's been backed by our military and oil since 1973. Because these other countries wanted oil and everybody needs oil and you have to trade oil in dollars, so they created strong demand for dollars. Question is how many? The last number I came up with was around $10 trillion is sitting offshore simply to conduct trade in oil. Now, what if you don't need those dollars to conduct that trade in anymore? Well, they're going to go, those dollars go somewhere, right? So if you don't want dollars, what do you do, right? So just recently, this also, I can't believe, like, are we living in these times? Janet Yellen was asked a question on the Senate hearing. She, they had said, hey, what if China decides to dump its treasuries? What's your plans? And she said, we don't have any plans, right? Of course not, right? But that's the great question because those aren't dollars sitting offshore. They're typically treasuries sitting offshore. And if the treasuries get sold, let's talk through the mechanism. I'm country A. I'm sitting on a lot of dollars, but they're in treasuries. I don't want them anymore. So what do I do? Well, I sell the treasuries. I'll sell them to you, Kenny. What am I selling them for? Well, they're U.S. treasuries, so you got to give me U.S. dollars. Now I'm sitting on U.S. dollars, but these were the things I didn't want. Now what do I do? I exchange them for something. Euros? Yen? Gold, property. I mean, it's it's very hard to get rid of ten trillion dollars without really moving the needle. All right, before we wrap up, let's talk about you went and found your community, and you and Evie have you know done an incredible job there, and you've done it. I mean, you left New York, you left Wall Street, you've done it. And do do you think that uh, if, uh, that's part of you know uh, where we should be heading? Well, I absolutely do. And, and of course, you know, the, the data says that's what the data says. But this is not about the data. Again, it's about it's about understanding what belief systems we have and making sure that you have enhancing belief systems in your life. And the first place to start with is finance, because it doesn't matter whether you're left or right or which religion you come from. Everybody cares about their pocketbook or the wallet. Right. So so that's important. But we often find that that's where we a lot of our limiting beliefs come in. So, again, we, it's primal time. What is wealth? Wealth is not money, right? Yeah. Where, how do you add value to something, right? Not how much money do you make, but how do you add value? Those are the prime questions we're, we're getting down to here. So honestly, through all of this, you know, want to know what, why, why I'm so excited by what's coming? Because we get to rip the covers off of lives that for a lot of people were, were devoid of meaning, purpose, not fun. That's what I think COVID taught us, right? They're like, where'd all these workers go? Well, they found out they hated going to work for that $9 an hour job down there, right? So once that veil gets lifted, then people are free to go, whoa, why am I here on this earth? What am I supposed to be? Who am I? And what am I here for, right? So I love watching that waking up happening. So that that's, that's this is actually exciting times, yeah. believe it or not. Well, uh, big hand for Chris. All right, thank you. Thank you, my man. I appreciate you.